when did you start to like crossing over to street? That was the end of like when freestyling was kind of was it dying out or was the street was taking over? Well, for me, it was more like I I wanted to try something new and interesting, and I was skating with uh, Steve Rocco quite a bit, and he and I started riding bigger boards, uh, a little bit bigger boards, not not as big as this at at, at the time. And then we got into, we learned ollies and started doing wall rides. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of fun to combine a little bit of flat ground street f tricks with some of this kind of you know, architectural skating, I guess you could right, call it, calling a, uh, riding walls and what have you. Was it like new tricks coming out all the time? All the time. That was like the whole thing. It was so fun to try to like really come up with new tricks all the time. That was something that I really enjoyed you know when you come up with something new and you usually came up with it when you fell you fall on a trick and then like oh whoa maybe the board can do this and then you go oh i'm gonna actually on purpose try to do what the board just did on accident so my favorite was trying to tie tricks together to make it feel as effortless as possible that was what i always tried to do and try to skate a little faster was there anyone ever, were people talking about like the direction of where skateboarding was going or everybody just doing their stuff and then it was some, some stuff became cool or some other stuff were not accepted or? You know, from my perspective, it, it was not a master plan of any sort that I, I certainly was on. And I can't speak for others. Maybe there were some people out there that could figure out like, hey, skateboarding is going this way. I think it was more spontaneity and just the idea of the inner drive of wanting to do things. And then if things fell into place, you saw maybe even connecting with another form of skating. And maybe that's where the whole street scene really came along when freestyle wanted to move into something in the streets and go further and go faster. But then the street people that would actually skate ramps would now do way more advanced moves by on rails and jumping down stairs. So if you combine flips with that, now you have street skating. And then of course, the flat ground ollie is really what revolutionized street skating and really tied. And that was, you know, Rodney took Alan Gelfin's trick and made it on flat. And combining the ollie with street skating is what really propelled it to insane level. To me, it seemed like a street skating was born when skaters got kicked out of skate parks and they were skating in the parking lot. My understanding, that's kind of the story of how street skating got started. You just skated where you could. So I would say street skating was definitely doing its own thing and grew. Freestyle did its own thing. And then yes, freestyle died uh, in, in a large way. But at that time, there were tricks that were picked up into street skating, like the Ollie, that then got developed by street skaters and, and, and Rodney, really, to levels of super technical yeah. So is this how you get discovered for uh, Back to the Future or, th or uh, thr the Thrashing? Yeah, yeah. So we would skate there every weekend when we could. And one day, uh, a guy left, a, not money in our hat, but he left a little, little business card and says, call us. And Bob and I go, all right, we'll call. Why not? So we call this guy. Um, his name was Bob Gale. Of course, he's a famous guy in Hollywood. We didn't know that, though. He said, yeah, we're working on this movie, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a Spielberg-backed movie. And we knew who Spielberg was, of course, and the movie's going to be called Back to the Future. And of course, when before a movie is made, you have no idea what that means. But all right, well, yeah, we're, we're here. Well, what do you want us to do? So the, the kind of the storyboarding showed us doing some crazy stuff that was not possible. Weird backflips over trains, you know, like crazy stuff. So we tamed it down a little bit to like a, a chase scene. And that was a little bit more manageable. So they made a skateboard, uh, kind of looked like a scooter with steel wheels back in the 50s. And, but it was actually real skateboard wheels on there. They were painted silver to make it look like it was steel. So we were shooting this um, chase scene uh, and we shot the scene twice. Actually, we shot the scene many times, but we shot it first during one week when it was shot with uh, Bob Schmelzer, because the star at the beginning of the movie was not Michael J. Fox, it was another star, his name is Eric Stoltz. But somehow Eric Stoltz ended up being uh, removed from the movie altogether under some circumstances that we could never really figure out. But anyway, Michael J. Fox comes up next and he's really short and so am I. 
although he's a little shorter than me. But anyway, uh, so we had to redo everything. And um, yeah, so it, both of us were able to be getting credit as stuntman in uh, Back to the Future. Um, and the movie turned out to be uh, very popular at the time when it was released. And even to this day, uh, the movie is is still very popular. So it's a nice family movie. You know? So you were not only the, the doubler for Michael G. Fox, you were also the coordinator? Were you helping them coordinate it? Or was it another person? Or how did it, like... I mean, you could say that we, we con they consulted us to see what's possible, but I, I would not call myself coordinator. But we tried to kind of show what's easier and harder that would still be visually interesting for the director of photography and for the director, which was Robert Smekis. Um, so we tried our best to, to be accommodating and also our stunt coordinator, he's mostly concerned about safety. So he would be the one making the ultimate call like, hey, you, no, that, that's too dangerous, don't do that. Or that's more dangerous, they need to be more paid. And so it's a lot of that dynamic that was really fun that we had no idea how it worked. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was, that was some really amazing times to be able to film that. It took about, uh, we were on the set for about two weeks total if I remember right. So it was you and who else? It was Bob Schmelzer, another so freestyle the, skater. So um, both of you guys, yes, yeah, you started out in Venice Beach. They just picked both of you guys. Yeah, yeah. no, it was just, you know, being at uh, the right place at the right time, so to speak. And uh, yeah, that, w that gave us that opportunity to, um, you know, I don't think they had an audition besides us. They felt we probably had what it took to do what they needed to be done for the movie. So that was also helpful that they wouldn't, we wouldn't have to go through like an formal audition. So it's like 85 or something? This is 80, uh, probably 83 um, and then maybe early 84. They were filming during 84 and I believe the movie came out in 85. Tony and I, we um, really wanted to try to come out with a skate video that was very different from the other videos back then. So back then when right before this film came out. What year? What year? This is 1990. 7, 1998. Most uh, videos by skate brands were done handheld video and the quality was pretty jag pretty jagged, you know. Um, and we wanted to see could we elevate that somehow and we were able to uh, work with uh, Jamie Mossberg and the direction was can we do this in film. Uh, uh, we knew that would cost a lot more money but we also felt you would be able to see the quality of the skating so much better. So that was one thing we were really uh, proud of, that we really pushed the envelope of making a skate video with, um, you know, 35 millimeter uh, film. And um, who was in the movie? Who was the, uh, the, the well, biggest? Well, Tony, of course, being the lead of Birdhouse, you know, the namesake is named after, after Tony. So he's obviously the star. Uh, but then we laced him with all the other skaters, laced him with, you know, you had Jeremy Klein, uh, Heath Kirchart, um, Andrew Reynolds, Steve Barra, Willie Santos, and then a few amateurs as well. So that made it kind of part of what everybody expected from a skate video back then. You wanted to make sure it wasn't just one dude. Um, and back then, it, I mean, really, it was seen as a fun eight, well, I should say a fun video with clips of three minutes and three minutes and three minutes where each skater kind of got their own part to their own song. So um, that was the kind of formula and it worked really well and the only difference really was we felt we now came out with a really high quality finished product and I think that resonated really really well because it really stood out and then from there on I think uh, uh, the quality of other skate companies videos also they also pushed the envelope trying to make the quality of the production a little bit better. Um, so I think that was something we were really proud of when we came out with that video. There, there's uh, there's like a, this, uh, um, you rented like a, a bullfighting arena, what was it, wasn't a bullfighting arena down in, in Mexico? Mexico? Yeah, so part of what we really wanted to do is to have a, you know, really extraordinary parts and Tony's part had to be like really crazy cool. So, uh, the team looked at places where we could build a massive ramp and the only place that seemed reasonable and had a good uh, kind of aesthetic background ended up being this bull, bull ring in Mexico. So the team built this massive 
uh, massive, massive uh, ramp. And uh, the idea was the whole, everybody except Tony said, Tony, you have to make 900. You have to make the 900. So we were all just heckling him because he didn't make the 900. And of course, it's easy for us to be the total not nice guy saying, oh, what's going on, Tony? You can't make 900? He tried so many times. But regardless, the video part was absolutely insane. And then, of course, to kind of add, I guess what you could call a skit to it, you, we had uh, Bucky Lasik uh, coming in and being the bad guy, you know, burning it all down to really funny special effects stuff part is probably not high quality but anyway um, that part was uh, and this is before he landed the 900 this is before he landed the 900 uh, right 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 before his right landed. before yeah. I have a feeling it couldn't have been more than a few months from the time we released it until he was able to make it in uh, in the X Games of all places which was amazing but that was fun times to be able to to put that together um, as a so where did the idea came, where did the idea came from to kind of like push something new in, in skateboard movie making? You know, it's it's interesting. I think you, we tried our first. You build a team, and you try to just have people that are, have this. I call it the inner drive. They just want to do cool stuff. They just want to push the envelope. They just want to do fun, new, crazy things. So that was kind of what we tried to get skaters to do that and we also then tried the same on the production side whether it was special effects or getting a filmer like uh, Mossberg um, and, and who, who knew his, his, his trade and the skaters knew its trade and it was just the idea of how, how can we push the envelope and um, we also had very many creatives in our industry including uh, Jeremy Klein and Heath Kirchardt who put together a pretty amazing part with a lot of pyrotechnics and and the, the skating they're doing was just so unique at the time. Skating on top of bus stop roofs. I mean, crazy stuff that at the, that time it hadn't really been documented really well. It might have had been done spontaneously somewhere. But they, they were definitely methodical about how can we skate this Best Buy sign? How can we skate this Texaco or Texaco gas station? Um, and that, a lot of those memories, I think now people, even now, like 40 years later, or 35 years later, like, it was just insane what they put together. But a little harder today than it was back then. Now you need permits, and music is a lot harder to get the rights for, et cetera, et cetera. But even back then, we had issues with music, because you kind of just renegated it and did what you wanted to have in, in your video. And that didn't work so well the record industry didn't really like that so they went after they went after us they went after probably just about every other skate company I can imagine unless they actually had it on the uh, written that they could use use that video uh, use that song for that video part so that was definitely part of the shenanigans in the skate industry back then is well so, so this is like when you're turning pro and stuff how long how long do you thought it was gonna last for I did, even, no, I didn't even. I just skated until I didn't feel like I progressed anymore, and that's kind of why I ended up. I went to school because I felt there would be an end to skateboarding at some point. That was probably the only foresight that I had. But also, my my parents uh, encouraged me to go to college, so I said I don't really feel like going to college, but maybe that's a good idea. So, so I did do that, and I'm I'm thankful because when I graduated, I was actually able to get a job. Uh, in the skateboard industry. So it was a natural, like, now I have an education in marketing and I understand skateboarding because I'd been my own promoter my whole career. I will be the one contacting shops to do demos. I'll be the one contacting television stations to try to, to cover skateboarding because we want to lift up popularity of skateboarding and also, selfishly, wanted to make a little bit of money uh, so you could live off of skateboarding, which we did. Uh, Okay, well, it wasn't. It didn't become wealthy, but it was definitely helpful. But the school part helped me because then I landed a job, and the easy part was I asked Stacy and George and see if they needed help at Powell. So start working. So at your Powell. business career started at Powell, and then you kind of ventured out on your own with with, with Tony. That's right. That's right. So I felt uh, you know it was a great place to to learn, and I really enjoyed the people there at Powell in Santa Barbara. I loved Santa Barbara. I still love Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful town. Um, 
And it's just that inner drive to want to do something on your own and do something new. That's what really triggered the idea of partnering with uh, Tony. And I obviously Tony felt the same. So we decided to put our heads together and, and start Birdhouse. And um, so we worked, I don't know, we worked 15 plus years together uh, building Birdhouse, but we also spawned and started and helped start other brands. You know, we started, um, we helped Andrew Reynolds to get started with Baker. And we also helped uh, Ian Deacon and Jeremy Fox to get flipped to move from the UK to the United States to get them started. So, and I've helped Jeremy Klein start uh, hookups. Um, and we, we both helped with that, with their distribution. So it was a lot about helping your, your buddies and your, your, your people in your sphere to see what can we do to contribute to their success. And that, that worked uh, like a charm for, for many, 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 many years um, until it didn't. <laughs> when did you start skating? Uh, 1977. So that's... Um, uh, it's booming in Sweden like crazy. Or were you, were you just got introduced? Skateboarding okay. just got introduced to uh, to to um, Sweden, I believe, okay. at least in my eyes, in 1977. Uh, it was introduced, and um, it looked fun. You know, like this is something you can do on your own. You don't need to be part of some sort of sport. I, I was into uh, basketball as a younger kid. I was into soccer, and. Uh, this seemed like something fun and something unique, something where you can add your own flavor to it rather than do what you're told. Why do you coach. think it's exploded so big in Sweden? For such a small country, it was still like enormous popular. Yeah, well, you know, Sweden is, was, and probably still is to a large degree. It's very homogenous. Like it's a very large middle class, meaning anyone can really afford a skateboard. They weren't that expensive. And uh, it's a little bit of a lem lemming effect where if one kid starts to skate, a lot of other kids want to try it. But it was still kind of an outlier and a little bit dangerous in some parents' views, uh, for sure. You know, my parents were also a little bit hesitant. I, I did not, I was not able to buy a skateboard right away. I had to rent my, my neighbor's skateboard. And that was kind of annoying, but at least I was able to skate. Uh, but I think that's the main thing. There so your career started out on a rented board. Yeah, I rented a board from, from my neighbor, yeah. And he, I guess he wasn't as into it, so he wasn't really minding. Can't remember, I, I always joked that I paid a dollar a day. That was probably not what I paid. But um, eventually I was able to buy my own board. <laughs> and uh, I really got into it. And once you get into it, you figure out where are the shops. And in this case, there was two main shops. One called Eurocana and another one called Gulo or Gulo and that's where all the energy was. You know, they would have pro skaters come in. For example, one of my favorite visits was when Tony Alva came to town. That's when I got really into freestyle. He was an all-around skater. He could skate anything. Uh, he would do barrel long jumps. He would do, I think he probably even did high jump at that demo. But there was the freestyle that I really got mostly excited about. He would do you know, just kind of cool turns, cool, cool space walks, and a couple of nose wheelies or G turns. And that really got me excited because that particular demo was on flat, so he couldn't skate. There was no ramp at that demo. He did that later at New Sport House where he skated a full pipe, uh, and that was amazing. And he skated a bowl with another pro from the UK, and that was also amazing. But to me, what resonated was the freestyle, just the stylish way of just being on a board. And you didn't need all this kind of ramp stuff and bowl stuff. So to me, that was just, that really was something I... Do you think Tony Alva is the guy that have had the most impact on skateboarding? Like when it comes to actually going around the world and introducing it? You know, for my generation, uh, absolutely. There, there's no doubt. Uh, I, I did end up seeing Stacy between him and Stacy Peralta, because Stacy also came to Sweden. And he was also very all around because back then it sounded like that's what they did they skated everything pretty much uh, so i would say between those two for sure in sweden and i know after the fact how both of them traveled a lot around the world i'm not sure who traveled the most that's not super important but just the idea that they really contributed to to growing skateboarding and this incredible opportunity to do something that felt unique felt different 
uh, creative. Uh, it was definitely a new outlet compared to the, the team sports that I was used to uh, being into myself or being exposed to uh, as a younger person, you know. So I'm what are you most proud of in your in career as a professional skateboarder? I don't know, maybe this. This is in France. Uh, did some sort of another power move on the truck. That was kind of one of my specialties, I guess. I would do a lot of power moves like that. Um, it's hard to say. You know, I'm mostly proud that skateboarding has gone as big as it can be, meaning I felt I really was part of contributing to make skateboarding grow. And freestylers helped with that in all these mall demos. There was always somebody who got into skating from there, and then they kind of jumped into something more perhaps up their alley. As you said, freestyling slowed down, but street skating really took off. But I think that's the proudest moment in terms of skateboarding, like contributing to get other people to see how fun skateboarding is. But then on a pro professional, uh, like a business level, I'm super proud of, of the brands I've been able to be part of, you know. Uh, to see today, 35 plus years later, I mean, Birdhouse is, uh, is obviously super strong uh, because of Tony Hawk. Same thing with uh, Baker. Andrew Reynolds have done a great job running uh, Baker to make it into kind of a cult brand uh, in a big way. Flip is still very strong and then hookups uh, Japanese animation you know with Jeremy Klein is still strong so it's really fun to have been part of helping them to get off the ground and, and, and do do what they are doing today so that feels really really good and that's been something I've always enjoyed you know I really like to see if I can be a little bit more in the background and, and help people uh, kind of realize or expand on their dreams, if you will, in the business world as well. Did you feel like when you were kind of retiring as a professional, were you already like, I'm done with this, I want to like promote others? Or was it, well, how was the that transition? I mean, hell, heck, if I was really still very good, I'm sure I probably would, but I got a little lazy on the skating side because my skating level, after I started working like, and again, I, only, I was only pro for like 10, 11, 12 years or so, which is short in today's uh, standards. I just didn't feel like I progressed and that could have been part of lazy and I really enjoy the business side. I, I really enjoy uh, different ways of promoting, you know. I love the idea of how can we in a better way promote this brand. And I've always been uh, very uh, close on physical products, like I love every single detail of a skateboard, anything from the washers to the hardness of the wheel to the width of the wheel to the radius of the wheel like all this really kind of nerdy stuff and that product intensity is something I, I, I that's where my intensity lays today I, I pay attention and I like to pay attention to a lot of detail on the product itself and then find ways how do you promote this how can you package this to make it sound more interesting and I usually uh, just do that by suggesting ideas to people are either a lot smarter or a lot better in front of cameras or younger or the audience would look up to that person more than they would like look up to me so to me almost like being that producer like in the movie sense you can be helpful but you're not you're more behind the camera than in front of the camera that's I'm more comfortable with as I, as I get older you know spontaneous skating I think those skaters are more popular where they just kind of do whatever But you could definitely tell at the contest when you see the same routine over and over again, it's likely that they probably wrote it down or it certainly has planned in their head, like, I got to do this trick after this. And I have a feeling some people probably still do it. And uh, I'm not for sure in their head they try to figure, what if I do this instead of that? Would, they, would that be a better flow? Would that be a better setup for the next one, whether it's watching uh, someone skating in the pool uh, where it's you still have certain restrictions versus like flat, you have a little bit more of a freedom of where are you going to make the move? Are you going to do a rolling move, a stationary move? So for me, it was helpful to kind of plan it out. That's kind of how, how, how my brain operates. Because I would also want to try to have as much variety in a contest because I believed that you didn't skate for yourself in a contest. You skate for yourself when you practice But when you skate in front of uh, a crowd, you're not skating for yourself, in my opinion. You skate for the crowd. You want the crowd to enjoy what they're seeing. You want to give the crowd something new and interesting. 
and hopefully that will resonate with the judges because you are there if you're competing you're competing and the idea is of course you want to do well uh, so to me it was very much about trying to skate for the crowd want to make sure I try to have new things every time and uh, I do think a lot of skaters probably do the same I, I, I hope so instead of just doing the same thing over and over and over again just to say that they were in a contest you know it's got to be something not just for themselves they should be for the crowd because otherwise you can just go skate on your own and then you're skating for yourself and that's usually less pressure perhaps more fun for most people a lot of people don't like to compete I kind of liked that a uh, little bit of a pressure I thought that was fun it made you try a little bit harder and then practice after the contest to try to do a little better next time so for me it was a motivator it was a good motivator oh this is kind of cool so this is when we shot uh, one of those Paltralta videos um, on the Hollywood's um, Walk, of Walk of Fame, that's right. So this is, the whole part was shot right here and then jumping over the fence with my, this is the time when I used to streetboard like you were saying. So that was kind of fun, uh, kind of combining a little bit of freestyle with street skating. So that felt fun. But back then I had to do my video part in, in three hours. So that's, that was the allotted time and then compare that to the end where we would give the skaters because the scale level is so much higher, it gives them almost a year to prepare their part because they get either injured or they want to make that rad trick. So the pressure to, to come out with the video part is intense but you also are given longer time by the fact that you have to wait for them to heal up and Make sure they get a video part. So you went for, very different from so you went for three hours to one That's year. That's it. Yeah, three hours. Stacey goes, yeah, we're going to film this afternoon. Figure out what you're going to do, and then we'll film it. And then um, uh, Robert Kittela actually filmed this, I believe. Maybe Stacy was with him, too. So Robert Kittela was one of the uh, photo uh, videographers, too, that um, I got to know, and I know him to this day. Super cool guy. Um, but, yeah, that was kind of, that was kind of it. But back then, there was fewer skaters, so it's obviously, it was easier to film the part. And, I mean, not to say that it was easy, what I did, but uh, to film the part today and try to have a unique video part, it's not that easy. Goal? Did you have a goal, or were you just kind of just free-flowing? Yeah, no, I mean, yes, on one end, it was free-flowing, but there were still... It, originally, I was told, I, although I can never remember uttering that, I want to be the best in the world. I was told I was saying that in my early years in Sweden, but I don't remember that. And then once I was here, I had like smaller, hey, I want to learn this trick. That was fun. Like, okay, I really want to learn this trick. So that would be kind of more sub goals. And then trying really hard, the goals would be, okay, when is the next contest? Uh, what song am I going to skate to? So you set the goal of finding a song that resonates with your rhythm. And then, okay, what tricks can I bring in? What new tricks can I bring in from, from, let's say, I combine the last stuff with anything new I've done. What would it replace? Because our contest form in freestyle was two minutes. So you, it's a set amount of time. So you know that in that time period, you want to make sure you really showcase a variety of tricks, technical as well as uh, simpler tricks. And uh, that was probably the only sub goals I would say I had, you know, like, hey, what can I learn for the next contest? Greatest thing Skate would have given you? Friendship, uh, a global view, because skating is so broad and it's touched all pretty much corners of the world where you've been able to appreciate new friends. Um, be exposed to a lot of good food and interesting foods from around the world. But I also feel what I learned from promoting my own career or being my own manager or my own career, I've just applied that to new business ventures. And it comes down to how can you present yourself in a way that someone else is going to like, because at, some, at the end, you're only worth what people are willing to pay. And uh, obviously, you want to make sure you get paid for what you do so you can continue doing it again. Um, so that's the one thing I've learned about 
promotion and marketing of my own career and then applying that as best as I could in new ventures. And the fact that you fall and you get up again and you fall, you get up again and you fall and you get back up again. The grit and discipline from skating is something you really need to carry on into any type of business venture if you're going to be an entrepreneur because there's a lot of setbacks and usually when you're your own boss you're the last person that people say thank you to you have to have incredible inner drive to just keep going and when you fall just get right back up and keep going that's what I learned from skateboarding <laughs>